Hi, everyone. Judge Andrew Napolitano here for Judging Freedom. Today is Wednesday, February 21st, 2024. Ryan Dawson joins us now all the way from Japan. Don't let his age fool you. Don't let that young face fool you. Uh -huh. Ryan is a historian and author and a political activist. Many of you may know of his work. Ryan, it's a pleasure. Welcome to the show. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. I, I'm older than I look. Oh, okay. <laughs> I want to talk to you, uh, at least initially, uh, about Israel and the slaughter that's going on uh, in Gaza. And I know you have opined on this uh, extensively. Uh, it, it appears to me as though no internal force within Israel uh, is going to stop the slaughter, and it will take an external force to do so. What will that external force be? Surely not the Biden administration. It's not going to be the Biden administration. And unfortunately, there's nobody really domestically within Israel that is going to be able to replace Netanyahu and do anything differently. The majority of the population due to the media in Israel is sold on slaughtering Gaza, on ethnic cleansing. The whole reason they're in a concentration camp to begin with is from the Nakba and pushing people there. You have to understand these people had to break out of a, a prison, a wall. They were walled in, over 2 million people walled in with machine guns pointed at them. That's what they broke out of on October 7th. And it's akin to blaming a slave revolt on the slaves rather than on slavery. Like, let's just remove the context of the occupation and ignore all that and act like it happened out of the blue. As far as external pressure, it's going to take not just uh, one party. It's going to be a combination of different things. So you obviously have the physical resistance of Hamas and Hezbollah and to a degree the Houthis in Yemen. Uh, but it's going to take international pressure and actual consequences, not a bunch of finger waving like the UN does. Israel's already been in violation of multiple UN resolutions. Right. It's not going to come from international court. That's They don't care. They'll just ignore those decisions. There have to be real economic consequences for Israel's behavior. And well, the, economic, the economic consequences uh, are the direct result of Israel's behavior and may very well come from the following places. Uh, all of the uh, young people formerly happily employed and, and economically prosperous that are now in the IDF, uh, all the Palestinians that used to work in Israel, now none of them do. Uh, the Red Sea being uh, used by um, uh, various groups in Yemen, not to kill Americans, but to prevent supplies from getting to uh, Israel. I mean, that's got to have an economic effect on Israel, which Prime Minister Netanyahu and candidly the 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 thugs in his uh, war cabinet will feel the pressure from in addition to all of that you also have a lot of israelis who have left because a lot of these people are right. from europe or america or somewhere else in the first place you know some of them will claim god gave them someone else's house they're not originally from there and so during the war a lot of them leave and some of them aren't coming back I don't see a lot of them in, from Ashkelon, especially, or other places adjacent to Gaza. They're not coming back to Israel. Those people are gone for good. And Israel is going to have a very hard time attracting tourists or people to, to come back and live in Israel. And it's important to the psychopaths in that government that they maintain a specific demographic majority for their group over everyone else. But they're leaving in droves. You know... Um... When this first started and it became apparent that the argument that Israel can defend itself was nonsense, it was a pretext for genocide and ethnic cleansing, uh, a lot of Israelis and a lot of Americans, perhaps you and I among them, were hoping that President or Prime Minister Netanyahu uh, would be removed from office. And once he's removed from office, he may lose his liberty or his, or his life. But... Here's a clip from the person who will probably replace him, whose attitude on this is the same as Netanyahu. It's not the same on other Israel domestic issues like the judiciary that he tried to bring under his thumb, but it's uh, the same on this. Here's uh, Benny Gantz, who I once thought uh, might be an appropriate person to replace Netanyahu. Listen to him, Ryan, which you're going to hear sounds like uh, Netanyahu wrote it. 
The world must know, and Hamas leaders must know, if by Ramadan hostages are not home, the fighting will continue everywhere to include Rafah area. We will do so in coordinated manner, facilitating the evacuation of civilians in dialogue with American and Egyptian partners and minim to minimize the civilian casualties as much as possible. To minimize civilian, ca civilian casualties as much as possible. No one except the most naive or collaborators in his lies can believe that. Yeah, they're attacking Rafa. They, they keep telling people, we'll just go to Khan Yunus. Oh, we'll just go to Rafa. And they bomb the places they tell them that will be safe. If bombing apartments is considered self-defense, I'd like to know what is offense. I'd also like to know, and you can put this to Jack Devine or any other Zionist shill, is there anything, any action that Israel could take that would be considered a war crime? Exactly what would they have to do for us to consider it a war crime? Because they already have snipers shooting kids. They already blow up hospitals, mosques, churches, kindergartens, you name it. Cut the power off, collective you know, famine, starvation, turning off the water, letting babies freeze to death in an incubator. What would they have to do for it to be a war crime? That's a great question, and I don't know how they would answer it. They may, they'll, they'll give you their standard argument that the Hamas fighters are hiding in hospitals and schools and mosques, and we have the right to destroy those buildings, and everything else is collateral damage. It's not collateral damage, it's we, uh, damage at all, Ryan. We um, did a piece uh, recently, which was brought to us by my dear friend Scott uh, Ritter, uh, about a four-year-old girl in her family's car everybody else in the car uh is dead a 15 year old cousin puts her in touch with the red crescent and she's begging the red crescent to come and save her and they say we're coming we're coming the red crescent comes the idf motions the red crescent to over the two red crescent drivers get out of the ambulance they're killed the girl is killed it's uh it's utterly reprehensible uh it is a it is a holocaust like uh, event for which there is no legal or moral defense or justification. Did you get a chance to watch any of the uh, presentations made to the International Court of Justice? I did, and it is, you know, it is a Holocaust-like event, and the president of Brazil got in trouble for making that comparison. They called him a Holocaust denier, and he wasn't doing that at all. He was reaffirming. He says, yes, it it is like that. You're like that. You're acting like Hitler. You're collectively killing civilians in a concentration camp. And that girl, by the way, the reason her family was in their car was to try to go get food because they've cut it off to everyone. And I think she was six years old. Maybe she was four, but she was just pleading, crying. It's getting dark. Help me in the, in the tank. They, they shot her. They knew this is a civilian. This is a civilian car full of civilians. They just went in and murdered her anyway. And there's so many things like that. And I, yes, I have seen the International Court of Justice. Uh, I don't put a lot of stock into it. I agree with Doug McGregor on this, that the U.S. and Israel will just ignore them. Right. I thought the arguments, the arguments made by South Africa and subsequently by the Palestinian uh, representatives were fabulous. Oh, they're uh, excellent. Because uh, the Israelis but, have no shame. They sit there right. and say the most ridiculous thing. They call them animals and so on. Herzog that is no different than Netanyahu, and you can go down every minister, and right. it's the it's the craziest things you've ever heard. I can't believe this is you know in this century that people can talk like this. The um, the head of the Israeli uh, in internal security, I guess the rough equivalent of the director of the FBI, this uh, madman uh, Ben Gavir, hmm. um, actually said that. Um, Palestinian women and children who in Gaza get too close to the border to Israel should have bullets put in their heads, and I will direct the Israeli police to do so. As far as I know, that's a, no, no, no one has uh, contradicted uh, contradicted that direction. You well, um, they did that in 2018 during the March for Peace. They would shoot snipers would sit there and shoot kids, unarmed people, women, men. Didn't matter, and the media there was just no coverage of it. You are. Um, 
we were kidding about your youthful face before we went on air, but you are a generation or two younger than I am, Maybe. <laughs> younger than uh, most of the guests that I uh, have on. Uh, what do young people feel about this, whether they're Republicans or Democrats, liberals, conservatives, progressives, or libertarians, atheists, or agnostics, white or black? What, what does the generation of 25 or 30 years old and younger think about this slaughter and Joe Biden's enabling of it? I think that the age doesn't matter as much as whether or not people get their news from the internet, which tends to be more from the younger generation than the older generation, but it's not a clear delineation. But I've seen that even in Korea and Japan, they've been holding rallies for Palestine. I never saw that in the past, like in 2014, it would be a little thing with some foreigners, but people not in the Middle East, not Muslim, not really tied to this directly, not Jewish, are starting to not just sit on the fence. They want to get involved because this is such a humanitarian crisis. And I'll tell you what it, what the difference is. It's the X platform. It's the only sort of mainstream social media platform that gives people access for the first time for a lot of people, people, these nine to fivers have never seen what Israel's been doing to Palestinians. Let's remember, they murdered 224 Palestinians last year before October 7th, pretty much in silence. Now they're seeing the video. They're seeing people pull bodies out of the rubble. They're seeing the devastation and they're able to see it because of Twitter or X. Right. Like, you well, can't, hope see, you can't see it, it on YouTube. They, I, you have, say, I hope they're able to see it because of judging freedom on YouTube as well. We have a huge audience, as you know, an, an enormous audience. I'm deeply grateful. My own background, as you know, is as a lawyer, a judge, a professor of law, a constitutional a scholar. I didn't think I'd be uh, in the midst of uh, foreign policy disputes, but judging freedom is almost exclusively foreign mm -hmm. policy. And lately it's been on this and on, on Ukraine. Do young people understand that the problems in Ukraine began with the American orchestrated coup in 2014. I think a lot of them do. Uh, I think a lot of them, they don't know the details the way you and I know them, but they understand, but wasn't there a coup d'etat? Didn't they go to war with Donbass and murder 13 to 14,000 people in 2014 and 15? They understand that they don't start the story in the middle as Thomas Sowell likes to say. You can't just start with when Russia invades. Donbass is trying to declare independence. They, you know, Ukraine broke the Minsk Accords. They fired artillery at an elementary school. That was the way they decided to do that. And, and they are, the younger generation is very mistrusting of mass media. They've been lied to so much about so many things. And they're even skeptical about YouTube and some platforms. Because even here, you do, you're right. You can talk about it, but you can't show it. If you show certain clips, even though there's nothing wrong with them and they actually don't they don't violate the rules, there's these unwritten rules and everyone knows you'll be demonetized or censored or banned if you do that. And they know that. And so they come and they see these shows and they go to Rumble and they go to Twitter, they go to Telegram and they're getting access to the better information. But the censorship is really if this really comes down to free speech. If they weren't able to lie. They, we wouldn't have these wars. We wouldn't have these sanctions. We wouldn't have intentional starvation. None of this would go on if you took away their ability to lie. And that is how you fix it. Free speech solves all of these things. It, of, when they went to Iraq, they had to lie about WMDs. When they went to right. Syria, when you pick something, the lie come, predicates everything else. One of our um, uh, guests, one of our regular guests is an American freelance uh, journalist uh, in Ukraine right now he's in Donbas. Patrick Lancaster. I don't know if you've uh, seen him. He's I know he, he's like you. He's fearless and courageous, um, but he lives in the war zone. Uh, he called us the other day and uh, said, "I'm in Donbas. I'm in my apartment. I just heard two horrific explosions. They had to be two thousand pound bombs. Explosions that big." And then he went outside. Cut number two, Chris, the one you just mentioned to me, and he saw this. 
And these are pieces of what is purportedly part of the uh, HIMARS rocket. Now we bring you this information from this intense attack here on the center of Donetsk because you deserve to see things from both sides of the line. Watch as much uh, sources as you can to make your own educated decisions because it's important not to be led by sh like sheep by the Western mainstream media and the people that want to tell you what to believe. Find out the information for yourself. Watch as much information as you can. All right, just to give you an, a little bit of an understanding on what the situation uh, here is and how big this rocket is itself. This is one of the two craters of these United States supplied HIMARS hitting this library in the very center of Donetsk. Okay. It was a HIMARS, which is worse. Because as you know, a 2,000 pound bomb is guided by gravity. HIMARS is a, is a smart bomb. It's guided by the uh, computer, which is aimed at the target. The target was a library. And the rest of that clip points out to a, a pizza parlor across the street. And another one of these HIMARS hit a crosswalk at a busy intersection. These are Ukrainian military firing American artillery filled with American ammunition at parts of what they say are Ukraine, but what parts of under Russian law are Russia killing civilians. Here we go again. Ryan. Unbelievable. That crater was deep enough. It looked like John McCain was trying to escape. They, this is something that people of Donbass have been putting up with for many years. I mean, they just they attacked a library, a pizza parlor, the sidewalk. And I was a little sad. I had a pause there as you, I was thinking of Gonzalo Lira. I mean, this is another American. They've essentially murdered him in prison or allowed him to die. No news about it. You know, Patrick is really doing the work. And, you know, I, I'd love for the press to be able to do that in Gaza, too. But the Israelis just shoot them. But yes, this is something you have to be reminded of. This is why Russia went in. The, they, there's a, they attempted ethnic cleansing in Ukraine, too. They treated the Russians in the East as second-class citizens. They made laws against them. They've been attacking civilians. And I think this was done out of spite. And the Americans know when high matters are fired and at what and when. They know. They give it the green light. They're, they're trying to give them even more money. They lost at Vitka, which was able to target the, in the Donetsk city. And so this is just out of spite. Let's just fire and hit a library. Let's see, let's just kill some billions. And the Israelis do the same thing. If there's ever a war in Lebanon, they won't be able to beat Hezbollah. They're just going to try and murder as many civilians in Beirut as possible. That's, that's their, uh, their own hostages. We'll hold your civilians hostage. And as Ukraine continues to lose this war, and they, and they are, and get more desperate, they're going to start targeting civilians more. You uh, you mentioned John McCain. I knew him well. Of course, we didn't agree on very many things. But sorry, sorry to hear that. Yeah. <laughs> One of my uh, colleagues, you may know him. He's got a great uh, podcast, a great uh, historian. Um, Tom Woods says, mm. no matter who you vote for, for president, you end up with John McCain. And he's right. If you look at all the killings and all the wars and all the slaughter, perpetrated by American presidents from as supposedly conservative as George W. Bush to as supposedly liberal as Barack Obama and everybody in between. I want to go back to Israel uh, for a minute and APAC. Mm -hmm. well, who controls Washington? Who has a better grip on Washington, Joe Biden or Benjamin Netanyahu when it comes to Israel? Well, both Biden and Netanyahu really answer to what we call the, the donor class. And APAC is their conduit. It takes money from this donor class, which benefits from the foreign aid, which is always in the billions. So essentially, the U.S. is subsidizing its own subversion by sending all this money to Israel. Part of it's earmarked to be spent on the MIC. The rest is funneled through this donor class to pick politicians on both sides of the pond. Now, in Israel, it's so bad. They're ideologically in line with this, this warped vision of this is our land from from mythology. But in the U.S., yes, I mean, Joe Biden always bends the knee to the Israelis. APAC, had, there were congressmen, Congressman Brian Mass went to Capitol Hill in an IDF uniform. Yes, yes. That's so treason. Right. <laughs> That's, that yeah. should, did he, did he uh, was he a member of the IDF at one point? I think he's, it was in their, uh, like, Civil Air Patrol or something like that. Wow. But he went in there in a uniform. Can you imagine that? Somebody in a, in a Chinese outfit or... Uh, right. 
Right. Well, believe. because, Only because Israel. it is Israeli and because of the vice grip they have uh, on the Congress, uh, there's no no complaints at all. I'm sure if uh, one of the squad wore something emblematic of, uh, of uh, Palestine, uh, they'd be reprimanded for it. In fact, one of them was reprimanded for saying on the floor of the House what Netanyahu says and, and Benny Gantz and, and Itamar Gavir say, uh, openly and publicly from the river to the sea. If you say from the river to the sea with a Palestinian flag in your hand on the campus of Columbia University, an Ivy League school not far from where I am now, mm -hmm. you get kicked off campus. Isn't that something? Universities are supposed to be the bastions of free speech where you can kick around ideas and hash them out and figure out what you're going to believe. And it's the exact opposite. There isn't any place in America where you have less freedom of speech than a university. And it's not just Israel. It's the safe spaces and woke culture for a series of things you're not allowed to talk about. And that's very troublesome. The yeah. fact that this whole cancel culture is 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 a detriment to free speech, which is, is tantamount to controlling what you're allowed to think. You couldn't even wear a Palestinian pen or lapel, much less full you know, regalia, let's call it. Uh, Ryan, it's a pleasure to chat with you, and, and I'm fascinated with your work and happy with your ideas. We'll do this again, uh, and we'll start with outrageous examples of uh, suppressing uh, free speech. And uh, we will post this, and hopefully our a huge audience will appreciate you as much as I have. Thank you so much. Okay, all the best. Safe travels. Uh, by the way, do you live in Japan? I did for 16 years. I live in Korea now. I'm over here getting my Korean visa, actually. So. Okay. All right. Well, safe travels, uh, and we'll see you again soon. All the best. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Judge Napolitano. That was fabulous. Judge Napolitano for judging freedom.